Welcome back. It's been only a week since I valued Tesla last Thursday and I was hoping not to come back to the stock. To be quite honest, I have lots of stuff to do. I need to do my data update post. But in a sense, what's happened over the week almost forces me to come back to the stock. You know, if you're just very quickly reviewing last Thursday, which was the, the 29th of January, I posted that I sold Tesla for $640. And I based it on a valuation I did where I valued the stock around 430. Yeah? And just to show you how bad my timing is, and I can and I admit it to it, I'm not good at timing these things, momentum game. The stock took off. In fact, how much? In the two days after I sold, the stock went up to nine hundred dollars. And of course, I heard from people. I heard from people saying, Well, aren't you sorry you sold the stock? And of course, there are people who took issue with my valuation on both sides. People who thought I'd been too pessimistic and that the value should really be 800, 900,000, 1500, and used the price rise to, to say, hey, I told you so. And there were people who said, hey, you've gone, you've, joined, you've gone over to the dark side. This stock is worth nothing, and that 430 is way too optimistic, especially given that I'd valued the stock at 190. Now, I, I don't know whether I conveyed this, but when I value a company, it is my valuation. It is not the, the valuation. I'm not saying I know the story. I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know what's going to happen. And I said, you know what? I, uh, I could be wrong. Your story could be different. Your value could be different. I don't think people got that ab abstraction because they continue to contest assumption as to warranty revenues, higher margins, lower, etc. So what I thought I'd do today is actually create a do-it-yourself valuation of Tesla. In other words, rather than me tell my story about Tesla, which I've already done, why don't you tell your own story? Because in a sense, it's a story. This is a company where we all have strong views. So let me show you the valuation I had you know, a week ago, and then we can use it as a launching pad. It, um, uh, I basically built an, a pretty successful automobile company, I thought, with revenues of about $125 billion. I gave the margins of 12%, significantly higher than a typical automobile company. I actually let them reinvest very little for the next five years because of excess capacity, and I gave them the cost to capital of an automobile company. I put in a 10% chance they could fail because they're still barely making money and they have a lot of debt. So that's a $430 value. And when you look at this, especially if you're not from, a, a de, you know, if you find numbers, you know, you, you, you know, you either find it off-putting because you don't like DCFs, you don't like n this many numbers on a page. I, I get it. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take my story and break it up into the four levers that drive that value. So there are a lot of numbers in that page, but there are four levers that drive the value. The first is the growth lever. The growth lever is controlled by what kind of revenue growth rate I use. In my story, I used a growth rate that allowed me to have $125 billion in revenues in 2030. That's five times larger than the revenues today. The second lever is the profitability lever, which is as the company grows, what kind of margin should I expect to see? And I gave Tesla 12% margins again by 2025. So the margin improvement happens pretty quickly. The third lever is to grow, you got to reinvest. So the third lever is the investment efficiency lever. How much will they need to reinvest to get to that level? And I was, again, optimistic. I assumed that at least for the next five years, given that they have some excess capacity built in already, that they can get away by investing. For every dollar they invest, they get $3 in revenues. And the fourth lever is the risk lever. And there are two inputs I use. One is the cost of capital, where I gave Tesla six point about a 7% cost of capital and a likelihood of failure that the company will not make it as a going concern. And as I said, it's a 10% chance. Those are the four levers. And that's what gave me my story and my value. So here's what I'm going to do. With, I'm going to take each of these levers. I would like to give you some background information. You might already know this stuff, in which case you can skip the background information. And you can then pick what you think is right for Tesla. So let's start with the revenues. To get a sense of how much Tesla can sell in 10 years, hey, let's take a look at the auto business. Even though you might have stories about software and side services, fundamentally Tesla will get a significant portion of its revenues in automobiles. How big is that market? And here you have some good news. If you look at the total market, it's about two and a half billion, two and a half trillion dollars. It is a big market. The mild piece of bad news here, it's not growing that fast. In fact, over the last decade, with everything put in hybrids, electric cars, the growth rate has been about three and a half percent. It's actually, you know, it's actually slowed down in the last five years. It's a big but slow growing market. Now to get a sense of what a big automobile company looks like, 
Well, let's take a look at the 20 largest, right? So if you look at the very top of the list, you have Volkswagen and Toyota, which have almost 300 billion in revenues. In the middle, of, in, towards the top of the list, you have Daimler, about 200 billion. You go down a little further down the list, you have BMW at about 100 billion. And then you go keep going further. At the bottom of the list, you got Tesla at 25 billion. Now, if you remember, the story I told you in my original valuation was 125 billion. I made them bigger than BMW, but could I have made them bigger? Sure. I could have given them Daimler-like revenues or even Volkswagen-like revenues. At Volkswagen-like revenues, you'd get about 10% of the total market. So you have some perspective on what would revenues look like. Now, of course, the other story about Tesla is it's really not an automobile company. It's a tech company that happens to be an automobile. Okay. So to get a sense of what a big tech company would look like, I looked at the very top of the heap. You know, I looked at the FANG stocks, Facebook, Alphabet, uh, um, you know, uh, Amazon, Netflix, Google, and Apple, and I threw in Microsoft for good measure. And you can see already that the revenues of these companies, even though their market caps are much, much, much bigger than Volkswagen and, um, and Toyota, their revenues are actually not as high. One of the things you notice about tech companies is they don't get the kinds of revenues that automobile companies do because they don't sell a unit for you know, an Apple iPhone, even though it's expensive, is not $50,000 or $80,000. But here's what they deliver in measures you don't see at automobile companies. They're incredibly profitable. Now, Amazon doesn't look profitable, but part of that is an illusion because of the shipping costs that they accumulate for their primary, uh, for ship, for Amazon Prime. If you add that back, their margins are about 15%. In fact, collectively, if you look at the FANG plus Microsoft, you, know, you get about 20%. Incidentally, the company that is closest to a software company here is Microsoft, the most, perhaps the second largest market cap company in the world, but its revenues are only 130 billion. So keep that in mind. Auto companies might not be as valuable, but they have big revenues, but the margins are not as good as the tech companies. So here's the first question I have for you. Whatever your story is for Tesla, it's an auto company, it's an auto plus software company, an auto plus software plus, or, you know, ride sharing company. You put in whatever story you want and pick an end game. Don't worry about growth rates. Think about what the revenues will look like in 10 years if they succeed. It could be 65 billion, would be Renault-like, 100 billion, BMW-like, 150 billion, which would make them closer to Ford and Honda, 200 billion Daimler, 300 billion Toyota, Volkswagen. Or maybe you have a story that you want to tell that's different. You could make it 500 billion if you want, if you set the growth rate to 50 or 60 percent. Now let's move to the second lever, the profitability, profitability level. Again, let's start with the business they actually are in, the automobile business, and the news doesn't look good here. Automobile companies have terrible profit margins. The median margins are 3 4%, no matter where you look in the globe, and there are lots of companies that lose money. It is true that the Toyotas and the Volkswagens might make money, but collectively, this is a business that is not profitable. Well, the news is much better when you move to the tech companies. Tech companies have a median mar operating margin of 10.25%, of and I'm including both software and hardware. It's even better if you look at the FANG stocks, the most successful tech companies, their aggregated operating margin. You think what's aggregated? I added up the operating income for all of the FANG stocks plus Microsoft and added up the revenues, and I get about 20%, 19.87%. And if you focus just on software companies, the margins are even higher. Now, if you're saying, why are margins so much higher in tech? And even a successful, the most successful pure automobile company in history could never deliver margins like this. And here's the reason. And you're a software company and somebody orders an extra unit. Let's say you're Microsoft and somebody wants, right now, remember, you're ordering it online. There is no cost associated with the extra units, almost all profit. The cost of goods sold on the marginal unit is very low. That's what the, that's what makes the margins high. In contrast, for an automobile company, even the most efficient ones, the cost of making a car is never going to be 5 or 10%. You saying, what about a company like Apple that sells the iPhone? You know, the iPhone sells for about a thousand, but the cost of making the iPhone is only 400. It's only 40% of the revenues. There's a reason why margins are so much higher in this business. So you ready? You can choose a margin. 
you can go with the median for the auto industry saying that's what there are you can give them some technology median maybe it's a software company i don't know that'll be really tough to make it all software maybe they'll approach the fang aggregate or maybe you believe there'll be some kind of a blended company where the margins are going to fall somewhere between auto and technology that's basically what i assumed with my 12 percent because it can't be just purely as an auto company now let's talk about investment efficiency again let's look at the auto business the way I'm going to measure investment efficiency is how many dollars of revenues do you get for every capital that dollar of capital you invest. Again, look at the looking at the automobile business, you can see that you have to invest a lot to grow because those assembly plants cost a lot. So you can see the median number for that is about 1.37. A really, really efficient auto company can ge generate about $2.4 in revenues for every dollar of capital invested. Now, what does it look like for tech companies? Well, the tech companies don't look much better. It's basically, if you look at tech companies, tech companies are not that efficient, partly because their revenues are not huge. Now, my estimate of $3 in revenues is not just higher than the most efficient automobile company. It's much higher than the averages in the tech business for FANG stocks. So, it, and it's aspirational because right now, Tesla is not delivering $3 in revenues for every dollar of capital. It's delivering about $1.32. So, you ready? You've got to pick a measure of investment efficiency by using a sales to capital. Remember, the way you use this is the lower the number, the less efficient you are. The more you have to spend to get the same growth rate. The higher the number, the more efficient. So I've given you a range of choices. Auto industry, first quartile, the median, the third quartile, technology, software, the FANG stocks, which don't look that great in terms of efficiency. And of course, you could then override all of these and create a special company, a company that you think has never been seen before. You know. Finally, let's talk about the cost of capital. Cost of capital, people have a very difficult time getting perspective. You ask people what a typical cost of capital is, you get numbers that actually are not even close to reality. So the start of every year, what I do is I do a histogram of cost of capital for all companies globally, 43,000 companies, and here's the distribution. Is a median cost of capital for a global company in dollar terms at the start of 2020 was 7.58%. In fact, look at that distribution. Look at 80% of companies have costs of capital that fall between you know, 6% and 11 I mean, this is not a huge range. What I'm trying to say is, you, if you're valuing Tesla and giving it a 20% cost of capital, that's way out of the distribution. So that's this table is just to give perspective. And if you look at the cost of capital for the different businesses, automobile cost of capital is only 6.94%. A tech company's cost of capital is much higher. It's riskier. All companies globally, the median cost of capital is 7.58. The first quartile is 6.27%. A high cost of capital would be 8.71%. Or you can directly input a cost of capital that you think is right. As for the likelihood of failure, maybe you believe that you know Elon Musk when he says the company's turned the corner our earnings are going to be positive we're going to be cash flow positive in which case they're not going to default or you can say look we're going to bounce back and forth even if you're an optimist you have a lot of debt and you have convertible debt and the stock price drops those dangers are going to come back and attach a 10 percent if you're a money loser and you don't see and you're worried about prices really dropping you might make it even higher 20 percent or if you really believe revenue growth is going to drop off then tesla is going to be in big trouble because they need growth to bail them out the property could be 50 percent so make a choice on both of those variables so Assuming you've made those choices and obviously you couldn't have made them while you were listening to me. That was too fast. You maybe you want to pause this presentation, go make those choices and come back. The values you're going to get are going to reflect your choices. So I'm not saying one is right, one is wrong, but the first three scenarios are pure auto scenarios. One is you give uh, Tesla BMW like revenues. You give it this, you give it the margins and investment efficiency of a very good automobile company, the 75th percentile, and the cost of capital of an auto company. The value per share you get is $106 per share. For a stock that traded at 700, you're in big trouble. Even if you give them 200 or 300 billion in revenues, the value per share rises only to 330. If you think of Tesla as an auto company front and center, then you're going to find Tesla to be overvalued. This is why when you see these comparisons of Tesla to Ford and GM, it's a waste of time. Of course, you will not buy Tesla if that's your comparison.
Of course, you might take a different perspective that Tesla is an auto company with a tech twist. And in the next three scenarios, so is what I did. I've given them auto company revenues. You need that because you need the big revenues. But I've given them tech company margins and tech company investment efficiency. I also have to give them a tech company cost of capital. And if I do that, the value actually doesn't budge that much. In fact, I get higher margins, but it's overwhelmed by the higher risk. My value range is from $111 to $300 per share. That's not going to do it. There's a third group of scenarios. What if you think Tesla is going to be the next great stock? Well, let's make them look like the FANG stocks. Basically, I give them auto company revenues again, because remember, the FANG stocks don't have huge revenues. But I give them FANG stock margins and FANG stocks investment efficiency. And I give them a tech company cost of capital. Now we're starting to see the value move. The value moves to $459 if you have BMW-like revenues. And the stock could be worth $1,200 if they have revenues like Toyota. And finally, with if you give them, and this is, I think, you pick and choose. You pick and choose the best possible scenario. Not just FANG, but you know, you, you pick your best. You, pay, you have revenues like Toyota, margins, uh, medians, uh, margins like a software company. You're a revolutionary manufacturing company and your cost of capital is an auto cost of capital. The value per share you get is 2,105. At this stage you're saying, well, therefore I can, whatever I do is okay, right? Well, you know, the stories here are giving you different values, but they are stories and not all of them are equally possible, plausible and probable. Now, in fact, the, the three part test that I use is it possible, is it plausible, probable. With each of these stories, there are questions you will need to answer. And I can't answer them for you because these are your stories. With the big auto stories, the question is whether Tesla can climb to the very top of the auto revenue ranks. Well, having margins that are, which usually is reserved for mass market auto companies, Volkswagen and Toyota. Well, earning operating margins that are usually reserved for luxury auto companies. So can it combine that? If your story is that it's a techie auto company, the key question becomes whether you can get the bulk of your revenues from automobiles while behaving like a tech company in every single dim other dimension. With, if you think it's a fangy stock, I don't even know that it's the right word to use. The big question becomes whether you should actually invest in a stock on the expectation that it's going to be the next great stock. You're saying, why not? Well, then you've set yourself up for disappointment, right? Because if it becomes the next great stock, you just got what was expected. And if it doesn't, it's all downside. And finally, with make your own, you know, it's your Frankenstein company, right? You picked uh, the best of each input. The question I'm going to ask is, can you create a company that earns revenues like Toyota, generates margins like Microsoft, invests like no other manufacturing company in history, and it's the low cost of capital of an automobile company. I'm not trying to prejudge this, but I'm saying you have to ask the key questions about your own story. So finally, there are a couple of things I want to kind of talk about before we end this session. One is, um, since I sold Tesla, I've been asked, do you regret it? And you might not believe me, but I don't. I bought Tesla in June of 2019 because I thought it was undervalued. I sold Tesla because I thought it was overvalued. I have to play the game I came to play. If I abandon the philosophy that I have, it might not even work, but it, that, it's my flaw. It's all I have. And I abandon it because I want to play the momentum game, a game I'm terrible at. Then even if I make a little more money on this, think of what I've lost. I've lost my core beliefs and I'm not willing to do that. And the other thing is whenever I write about Tesla, I, I duck for cover because I mean, I get assaulted from every side. I mean, can we disagree without being disagreeable? What, this is just an investment in a world where we're divided on politics and religion and culture. Do we have to add investing to the mix? I mean, I, you know, if you are holding on to Tesla and when I sold, I mean, the fact that I sold doesn't make your profits go away. I wish you the best. I hope you make a lot more money and I'm not, no, I'm not going to begrudge you that. No. And if you sold short and you've lost money, I, I, I have no joy out of your losses. I'm not going to dance on your, you know, I'm not going to do some celebratory dance and a, a touchdown dance or something. Why? Well, you know, how do I benefit from you losing money? But, you know, uh, I find there is so much inbuilt anger with this stock on both sides. That's almost impossible to have 
a serious debate. And finally, and as far as I'm concerned, Tesla is a fascinating company. I'm going to keep coming back and value it. I might buy it in the future. I might not buy it in the future. But here's what I can promise you. It is not some, uh, com something I want to lose sleep and friends over. Thank you very much for listening.